So let's do this. My name is Phil Yevix, and I have the honor of welcoming you here on behalf of the uh, Department of Theology and Religious Studies, which is one of the co-sponsors of this event, and the Catholic Studies Program, which is also sponsoring it. And as you may be aware, the, it is, the lecture is being taped, so it will be available on the university's YouTube channel, usually in two or three weeks. Uh, and, and if you know people who wanted to be here but couldn't, we will try to circulate that URL so people can find it conveniently. <clears throat> I'm up here partly because Dr. Patrick Clark, who is currently the chair of the Catholic Studies Program, has a wife who is very pregnant, and as, as far as I know, she's still in one piece, but he is a little, uh, has to take care of the other six children while she's taking care of that. And I am retired from the University of Scranton. I had the pleasure of working for uh, the good doctor for several years with the graduate the continued School of Con Graduate and Continuing Education. But I've been involved um, with the Scranton Area Ministerium, and Father Jim Reddington here is our Vice President of the Scranton Area Ministerium, and through that got involved with Christian Communities Gathering, which is a Christian ecumenical group in Lackawanna and uh, Wyoming counties. <coughs> And uh, Monsignor Vince Grimalia, who was the ecumenical officer of the Diocese of Scranton, chairs that group. He was not able to be with us this evening because of some health considerations. Um, but through Christian Communities Gathering, this was the initiative for some conversations about this 500th anniversary of Martin Luther publicizing his 95 Theses, the event that's usually celebrated on October 31st and 1517 is the date normally given for that first publication of his 95 Theses. And I had suggested to Christian Communities Gathering that this historical commemoration is actually an excellent opportunity to have some historical investigation about the factors which led and nourished the Protestant Reformation, but also in the hope that it could give some perspectives about con the contemporary interfaith situation in its many dimensions, and the hope that people who take their faith seriously could have this opportunity to reflect upon the past and how it in impacts upon us today. And so it is from that that the Catholic universities of Northeast Pennsylvania agreed to try to sponsor some lectures. And so far, this is the only one actually scheduled, but we do actually have uh, in process uh, lectures that will hopefully take place at King's, University, King's College, Mary Misericordia University, and Marywood University, one later this fall and two in the spring coming up. Uh, and we've chosen the kind of the tagline after 500 years, kind of an homage to Eve Congar's after 1,000 years, uh, the book he published back in the 60s on reflecting on the 1,000-year celebration, uh, separation of Eastern and Western Christianity. And the hope is that reflecting upon this historical separation of the Christian denominations can help us to come to a better, see our way forward towards a reintegration of Christendom. And so again, on behalf of the Catholic Studies Program at the University of Scranton, the Theolo Department of Theology and Religious Studies, and the ecumenical group Christian Communities Gathering, Welcome to the University of Scranton for Father Schaffer, or Father Schaffer, yeah. <laughs> He is a father of many times, um, several times over, not many, but. Nice, nice, Well, that's a. <laughs> Robert Schaffer received his PhD from the University of Notre Dame in medieval history and has been a member of the faculty at the University of Scranton since 1995, where he teaches courses on ancient, medieval, Byzantine, and early modern European civilization. Having had the privilege of sitting in on his Byzantine history course, I can tell you that references to Notre Dame athletics are frequently sprinkled into his lectures, not to mention references to the Chicago sports teams at every available opportunity. He is the author of a number of groundbreaking articles on indulgences in the Middle Ages, Middle Ages and has published two books on the subject. The first, The Penitent's Treasury, was published in 2007, and it attempted to reorient indulgences within the leading spiritual movements of the high and late Middle Ages. 
His second book on the subject, Indulgences, Dominicans, and Imperial Rivalry in the 14th Century, was published in 2014, and it examined attacks on Dominican indulgences during the disputed German imperial succession in the first half of the 1300s. In the summer of 2016, he was invited to participate in a week-long seminar on the origins of the Reformation in Berlin. And in the summer of 2015, he was invited by the German Historical Institute in Rome to address an international symposium on Tetzel and the early indulgence dispute. That address, which has been published in the German, by the German Historical Institute, forms the basis of his talk this evening. It is my pleasure to present to you Dr. Robert Schaffern. Well, thanks to Phil and Chris particularly, along with the other sponsors. Uh, very nice to be uh, asked to give this address tonight. Uh, again, in keeping with uh, uh, a whole uh, range of uh, meetings going all over the world, particularly in Germany, of course, uh, there have been conferences and lectures and symposia marking the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Now, as much as one might like to say something entirely new and exciting about all this, uh, it remains nonetheless true uh, that the Reformation originated in the spiritual creativity of the observant Augustinian friar, not monk, friar, uh, Martin Luther. Uh, the insights that uh, uh, occurred to Luther uh, came to serve as the foundation of evangelical Protestantism. Uh, now those insights, uh, as I was just telling my class the other day, uh, probably preceded the in indulgence controversy of 1517 by two years. They probably came to him in 1515 as he was working on his commentary to St. Paul to the Romans uh, in the tower, in his sort of tower study at the University of uh, Wittenberg. Uh, he described, uh, it's uh, interesting, he described this conversion experience, this tower experience, Tyrmir Leibniz, uh, very vividly about 30 years after it took place. Um, it's uh, recorded, in fact, in the table talk, uh, a, long, uh, a long series of discussions he had with students uh, after having served uh, for a couple of decades at least uh, as a teacher and as a pastor uh, in Wittenberg. Uh, this means, of course, that for two years, two whole years, uh, the only people who were familiar uh, with Luther's new ideas about the human person and uh, uh, atonement before God, if in fact uh, that, can, it, it, that can even take place. But for two years, the only people who knew about these ideas were Luther, his students, and his closely associated uh, academic colleagues, to say nothing of his religious superiors. It was a very small cast of characters. The world, of course, began to learn about these ideas in 1517, in the famous contro indulgence controversy of October of that year. And uh, I might as well say uh, at the outset that uh, uh, the, the whole idea that Luther had nailed the 95 theses to the cathedral door at Wittenberg has now been uh, uh, yeah, it's, 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 all, it's all been tossed. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first time Luther publicly announced uh, his ideas about indulgences was in a sermon uh, that he gave in Wittenberg after hearing about uh, the indulgence that was to be preached uh, in, uh, nearby in Germany, uh, but not in his own province. It was forbidden uh, to be preached in the province, actually, of Saxony. So once the indulgence, before we actually get to talking about indulgences, uh, the indulgence uh, came about as a consequence of the papal decision to pull down old St. Peter's. Uh, the St. Peter's folks that is in Rome now is not the first church uh, built on the site. In fact, it's the second. The first church was built by the Emperor Constantine around 330 AD. Uh, as Constantine was uh, inclined to do after uh, accepting Christianity, he hunted around for places that uh, prominent people were buried and wanted churches to be built there. Uh, the tradition that Peter had been uh, buried on the Vatican, because the Romans did not bury people within their cities. The Romans built, buried people outside. Uh, and the Vatican at that point was outside the city of Rome. 
Uh, so that church was built by the first Christian Roman emperor, Constantine I, around 330 AD. Well, by 1450, the old girl was showing a lot of signs of wear and tear. And so the popes decided to pull down old St. Peter's and start building a new one. Now, as you, uh, as you may well appreciate, uh, the building of a new basilica is a major enterprise and also very expensive. So uh, the popes resorted to an old practice of the church by this time. It had been going, around, going on for a couple hundred years at least of, uh, of, pro of proclaiming an indulgence for those who would contribute funds to the building of new St. Peter's. Now, by the proclamation of this indulgence, folks, uh, the church had been granting indulgences for about 400 years. And they had had a long pre, uh, indulgences themselves had a long prehistory uh, in uh, the uh, antique and early medieval church. Uh, they were sort of an addition onto the ancient process already uh, uh, mentioned in our earliest texts uh, that called for the confession of sin first and then the commission of good works to sort of make it up to show that you're in good faith and not just saying, oh, I'm sorry, but I'm just, you know, I'm just doing it to, to get out of it. Uh, that was one thing. Uh, and the other thing, of course, was that uh, um, uh, uh, just as we do with our friends, okay, uh, when we offend them, we apologize. And then uh, to uh, make our friend understand that we're serious about the apology, we ask, well, how can I make it up to you? Okay. And Scripture, in fact, uses this kind of language. Scripture describes us as friends of God. Okay. So at least, at the very least, we have that metaphorical relationship with God that we have with our uh, with our close fellows. Indulgences were offered for just about every good work imaginable. And this, this ought to be interpreted uh, pretty laterally. Uh, they were uh, offered for crusades, of course, for uh, scholarships. Maybe we ought to offer some indulgences for students at the University of Scranton to help you pay your tuition. Um, uh, for pious building projects like churches, but also like roads and bridges. Okay. The building of roads and bridges were believed to be a good work because it made travel safer. And travel in the Middle Ages was notoriously dangerous. As well as, of course, the building of churches. Okay. Uh, the uh, rationale being that in the church, uh, the mass would be celebrated, prayers would be offered for the benefit of the community, uh, for the living and the dead, and so uh, uh, they, uh, they consequently merited uh, favor with an indulgence. Now, mind it, uh, at the same time, an indulgence could only be granted by a bishop. It cannot be granted by a priest. Okay. And every proclamation of indulgence that I have ever come across, and after 30 years of this, there's a you know, it's a big number. Every proclamation of indulgence says uh, that if you hope to receive its benefits, you have to be confessus et contritus, confessed and contrite. That is to say, without sacramental confession, without a prior sacramental confession, the indulgence is worthless. Okay? You can go ahead and do the good work if you want, but it's not going to do you any good. Now, once an indulgence was decided upon, in this case it was by the Bishop of Rome, uh, it had to be publicized, otherwise nobody would know about it. There's no television, there's no CNN, uh, there's no radio. So indulgences were, sp uh, the news of an indulgence was spread in the only way available, word of mouth. Okay? Although, of course, after 1450, sometimes uh, print was used. Uh, so it had long been the practice uh, that when an indulgence was decided upon, we have to find preachers of indulgence. We have to find people who will go to par basically go to parishes, kind of like today. You know, when uh, if you if you're regularly worshiping Catholic, you know, every now and again a missionary will will come to church and, and give the homily instead of the priest. Uh, it kind of worked that way. Uh, that these uh, wandering uh, 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 preachers of indulgence, mind minded, they had to be licensed. You had to have a license in order to do this, and you had to present it to first of all the bishop of the diocese. And then you had to present the license to the, uh, to the uh, rector of the parish. 
Okay. Otherwise, you don't get in the church. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, preachers of the indulgence had to be found, commissioned, sent on their way, and there you go. Okay. So it was actually a, a fairly complicated uh, enterprise. Then the preachers of indulgence would take the uh, news of the indulgence into the towns and into the cities and countryside, uh, countrysides of, uh, of Catholic Europe. Of course, these were not part of the Orthodox experience, only part of the uh, Catholic experience. And for, um, for uh, those who were sort of specialist preachers, okay, they were oftener tapped for the job of spreading an indulgence. Uh, than, other, than others were. And so this became uh, one of the sort of uh, specialties of the Dominicans, of the OPs, of the, or, uh, of the Ordinus Praedicatorum, the order of preachers. Preaching was their main commission as, a, as an order of friars. And so that brings us to our guest of honor here, Johann Tetzel. Okay. Um, chances are good that this is nothing like what he looked like <laughs> uh, because the engraving was done long after he was gone from the scene. But here you go, and he's, uh, he's easily identified as a Dominican, right, because of the white habit and then the black cowl, okay? Uh, Tetzel, uh, by 1505, 12 years before the Great Indulgence Controversy, Tetzel was already a well-known figure among the German Dominicans of Saxony, Thuringia, and Poland as well. He seems to have had a stationing in Poland for a while. Um, and by the way, of the, of the so-called mendicant orders, uh, the Carmelites, the Augustinians, the Franciscans, and the Dominicans, in the German-speaking regions of Europe, the Dominicans outnumbered the Franciscans. It was the only place that that happened. Everywhere else, the Franciscans outnumber, uh, well, everybody else, uh, particularly Italy. So uh, Tetzel was a major figure. Uh, he was an authority. Uh, he was a trained uh, theologian. Uh, uh, he was um, uh, involved in uh, a number of uh, Dominican enterprises and so on. But uh, almost uh, from the beginning of the indulgence controversy, Tetzel was the villain of the story. Even though he never preached the indulgence in Luther's hometown of, or well, at that time it was uh, his hometown was Wittenberg, the two men never met. In fact, Luther never even got into Saxony. I'm sorry, uh, Tetzel never even got into Saxony uh, because he would not have been permitted there. Okay, Elector Frederick said the indulgence is not going to be preached in Saxony, so no indulgence in Saxony. Um, When Luther got news that this indulgence was going to be preached in the northern German regions, he then decided to, to preach a sermon against indulgences, the sermon against indulgences. Um, uh, he was hoping uh, to forestall uh, a Tetzel mission in Saxony, but of course, Frederick sort of took care of that for him, and so it never, it never happened. Um, Luther, of course, uh, was a university professor. And here's another thing about the Reformation, folks. In its origins, it's not a grassroots movement. It was a movement of elites. It was a movement of college professors, God forbid, and princes. Okay? That's, that's where the Reformation gets its start. It's not a grassroots movement. And there were a number of uh, figures in England and in Germany who were fearful of the reaction of the common people when Reformation would be implemented. Okay? And in a number of instances, those encounters proved to be extraordinarily violent. Okay? So it's not a movement, uh, it's not a grassroots movement by any stretch of the imagination. It's a movement of elites, at least in its origin. Um, so uh, uh, when Luther preached, most of his audience were other professors and their students. Okay. And this is how uh, his ideas about um, 
indulgences uh, first came to be propagated. Okay. Um, one of the curiosities of all this is it seems that Luther's listeners and his Catholic opposition understood the significance of what he had to say quicker than he did himself. Okay. Now, that's not really surprising considering that Luther was, Luther was not a systematic theologian. Okay. He wasn't trained as a systematic theologian. He was trained essentially as a, uh, as a, a primary language interpreter of the sacred page. Okay. So sometimes, and he appears to be all over the place, and in fact, later Protestants, most notably Calvin, would demonstrate this to be true. Calvin was the great systematic genius of the, Re of the Reformation. It wasn't Luther. Luther was the great original genius of the Reformation. Um, through the grapevine, as it were, uh, Cardinal Albert of Brandenburg got word of what Luther was preaching. Albert was worried. Uh, he, was, he suspected that what Luther was teaching ran against Catholic teaching, and so informed Rome of what was going on in that little quiet corner of Saxony. The Pope sent Cardinal Cajetan to see what was going on up there. And from then on, uh, the whole controversy just sort of snowballed. As far as Tetzel was concerned, uh, I got to believe that his reaction to all this was one of shock. He was utterly surprised by what his little uh, missionary enterprise on behalf of the indulgence uh, initiated. Um, we uh, have a text written in German by Tetzel, it's called the Vorlegung, which means rebuttal in German. Uh, and uh, Tetzel got a copy of the sermon that Luther had preached on indulgences. And so uh, Tetzel wrote a text uh, entitled uh, The Rebuttal to the Sermon on Indulgences. Uh, Everything that Tetzel says in that treatise is in keeping with the traditional teaching of the church. Okay? Um, it has long been customary, and it's been done almost unthinkingly, to associate uh, the distribution of indulgences with abuses in the church. Okay? I can't tell you how little evidence there is for such a view. Okay? There's almost none. Okay? Uh, the popular depiction is the result of generations of unthinking parroting of what had become a very heated dispute between the principles at the time. Okay. Um, for instance, it's commonly said that Tetzel, for instance, was a seller of indulgence. Okay. Nobody ever sold an indulgence, guys. It never happened. Okay. Not in the sense of a commercial sales where I give you a couple of bucks and you give me a sack of coffee. Okay? Uh, most indulgences, first of all, didn't involve any transferences of cash. The vast majority of indulgences are for the recitation of prayers. They're not for, they're not for donations of money. Okay? And where money is required, it's required for a pious donation. Okay? Kind of like what we do today uh, when we do fundraisers in the church. Okay? Now, it is true uh, that um, it was said in the Middle Ages that there were selling of pardons, for instance. But the selling was, uh, the, the, the use of the word selling was equivocal. Okay? And I am convinced that the average believer understood the difference. Okay? It's also one of the reasons why, for instance, Aquinas talks about this at the beginning of the Summa. Okay? Uh, that in trying to get at, at these theological truths, which are extraordinarily difficult and often don't pertain to the realm in which we find ourselves, okay? we have to use metaphorical and equivocal language. And the talk about selling indulgences in the Middle Ages was like this. Okay? But it was not a commercial sales by any stretch of the imagination. I have never found any bit of evidence hinting as much. Okay. okay. Um, here's another thing, too, about uh, a sort of myth about the... Uh, the Reformation. Um, 
of course, uh, the story about uh, Luther nailing the 95 Theses is well, we discounted. Now, he, he did write the 95 Theses. Uh, but here's the thing. The following year, 1518, Luther published a retractations of the 95 Theses, in which he said that, you know, some of the things I wrote in the earlier text, no, not really. Okay. And of the retractations, the commonest retractation is the one where he had said in the 95 Theses that the ordinary believer doesn't know what they're doing when they buy an indulgence. He said, no, they, the, the people know. And I have, so I have to withdraw that now. Okay. Now, there's still a problem here, but we can talk about that later. And there's a problem for Luther here, but those, we'll we can talk about that later. Uh, let's go to another image here. Okay, now I'm really sorry about how small this is. Um, maybe I can... Try the corner. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, the, the, you know there was a yeah you know there was a big there was a bigger photo but it was all dark and you could see that I, now th this one's easier to see but note this is and it's preserved it is in the Wittenberg Museum this is the chest that was to contain the receipts from the indulgence that Tetzel was supposed to preach okay now take a look at this first of all okay even empty it weighs a ton. Okay. And treasure chests were all built to weigh a ton. Okay. Why were treasure chests built to weigh a ton? So you couldn't make off with them very easily. Okay. And then when this thing was full of precious metal, okay, about the only thing that was going to be able to move it was a team of oxen. Okay. That's one thing. And note also that there are three different locks on the chest. Okay. The bishop would have had one lock, the bishop in, where, in which the diocese, uh, in which the, uh, in which diocese, the do, indulgence of the priest, sorry, for the preacher himself, and for what we might call an auditor. Uh, these were people appointed by bishops. They were often laymen with extensive experience in the keeping of accounts. They too were given a lock to the box, okay? So the only way that, and of course that little uh, plate there, there's a little uh, coin slot in it. I don't know if you'd see it, okay. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this was to, you know, the purpose of all this was to secure the monies raised by the indulgence, okay. And all three of these figures had to get together in order for anybody to get at the money. And the custom was for the treasure chest to be kept uh, generally be kept with the bishop, okay? Under lock and key in a church, okay? Um, uh, of course, another thing is, again, every preacher of indulgence needed a license. He needed a document to present to the bishop. He had to go to the bishop when he entered the diocese, show the goods. The bishop does not have to permit the preaching of the indulgence, just like Frederick uh, just like Elector Frederick said, you can't preach the indulgence, okay? But, if, but normally the bishop says yes. We do know from English evidence, there's no reason to think that this is different anywhere else. English evidence just survives more copiously because there are more documents and uh, the world wars didn't blow junk up all the time. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we have English evidence uh, that uh, tells us that church authorities kept their eye on these people, okay? So we have, for instance, we have Episcopal registers that say we're not going to accept indulgence preachers from that hospital or that group or that whatever because we think they're shady, okay? But we also have documents that say, yes, accept the people from there, they're, they're kosher, they're all right. Um, then, of course, uh, the, once given the permission to preach in the diocese, you'd wander, you know, you'd, you'd uh, do a circuit, Okay. Again, uh, they were normally preached inside a church. And just like today, you can't preach in a church unless you get the permission of the pastor. The pastor could tell this guy, we're not going to listen to you. Okay. And even if he gets in, all receipts are voluntary. Nobody can be forced to 
make a contribution to a, an indulgence. It's all, it's all entirely voluntary. Okay. Anyway, uh, so this was uh, customarily how indulgence receipts were obtained and stored, and there was a very formidable constabulary about all this, making sure that, now, now look, uh, 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 the, the church laws indicate very clearly that um, church authorities were fully aware that, uh, that there, were, there were things that could go wrong here. Um, church authorities in the Middle Ages were especially worried by wandering preachers, uh, by wandering clerics of any time, uh, of any type. This goes all the way back to the rule of St. Benedict. Right? He talks about the gyrovags. Okay? You don't have to know Latin to know that gyrovag is bad. <laughs> okay? These are the lowest kind of monk because they don't sit still. Okay? So they can come in and say, oh, I'm a monk. Well, how the heck do I know? Okay? Um, here's another thing about medieval villagers. Uh, I would suggest they were much like uh, people in Appalachia are often, you know, uh, stereotypically, right, very wary about strangers. Medieval villagers were like this too, okay? You can say whoever the heck you are, but I don't know who you are, so I don't know, okay? Especially when you're asking me for my hard-earned money and I'm trying to, you know, uh, eke out a peasant living with this plot of land I got, okay? So they were very, they were very savvy uh, and uh, um, uh, this sort of notion that they, you know, believed in miracles at the drop of a hat and this kind of stuff. Nah, that, that, that's just not uh, the way it was, not the way it was at all. Okay. Um, uh, another, uh, another little artifact here. I love these. Which th this one. Okay. Now, again, too, this is... Um, Oh, it's a little better than that. Now, this is, uh, uh, this is one uh, of a number of sort of broadsides. Uh, they were just, uh, you know, uh, posters, essentially, uh, printed very cheaply. Uh, early 16th century printers uh, uh, made a mint uh, printing really cheap stuff. Uh, the, book, the, the money wasn't in the books, actually, for printers. The money was in pamphlets. Um, uh, anyway... Uh, this is a, uh, a, a, well, a cartoon, essentially, um, depicting uh, Tetzel preaching the, the indulgence in favor of St. Peter's. And you can see in Latin his name, Johannes Tetelius, which is just John Tetzel. Piernensis, his hometown was Pirno uh, on the Polish-German uh, border. Now, uh, it's in this text that we get the famous saw about, you know, when the coin in the coffer clinks, the soul from purgatory springs, okay? Um, again, there's, there isn't, outside of this broadside, there isn't a scintilla of evidence that uh, Tetzel ever said any such thing, okay? And, if you take it, right, we, uh, the broadside is undated, okay? And I suspect that it's from about the 1530s or 40s, okay? at a time when, uh, at a time when both sides hardened. Uh, one of the stories that's not told often enough about the Reformation is that there were people on both sides who believed that the schism was not permanent, okay? and history actually was on their side. There had been plenty of schisms in the Catholic Church prior to this one. Okay? And most of them had been reconciled. The vast majority of them had been reconciled. And there were Lutherans like Melanchthon, okay, who hoped to come up with some kind of common ground. And there were Catholics like Cardinal Contarini and Cardinal Pohl, uh, who was uh, uh, direct, essentially director of the English Church under, uh, later under Queen Mary. They too, hope for some kind of uh, common ground with the Protestants. As we all know, that's not the way it happened. Uh, among the Lutherans, Matthias, a figure named Matthias Flaccius Illyricus. They always take the humanist Latin name. He's, Matthew of Croatia is basically what that means. Uh, 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 he was a hardliner, uh, and essentially he got his way. 
Uh, and of course, the Council of Trent got its way too. Uh, the Council of Trent made no uh, made no uh, um, overtures to uh, uh, to the Protestants whatsoever. Um, at any rate, um, and uh, uh, you know, again, uh, take a look. Right, the chest still has the three locks on it. Okay, and um, of course, uh, the uh, couplet about the coin and the coffer and all that's only the last two lines of the of the broadside. Um, the rest of the, 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 uh, it took me a while to translate this because it's, that, that fractor type is, 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 is often really difficult. But, oh, you Germans, heed well what I say. I am the servant of the Holy Father, who alone now brings you 10,900 quarantines. Uh, that's a period of 40 days, by the way. I had, yeah, I, I went back and forth for the, it's Karen's in, in, in this thing. And, of course, I was looking in German dictionaries all over the place of what the heck is a Karen. And uh, of course, it was there. And then I took a look at some of my old stuff. Oh, it's got to be quarantine. That's, that's the, the German form of quarantine. And that's just a period of 40 days. So 10,900 periods of 40 days. That's how much these indulgences are worth. Uh, of grace and indulgence for one sin, either for you or your parents or your wife or your child, everyone shall be protected according to what he puts in the coffer. As soon as the coin in the coffer clinks, so quickly does the, whole, does the soul into heaven springs. Okay. Uh, it's all a bit clever by a half. Okay. Now, uh, to be sure, uh, in the later Middle Ages, we also know uh, that there were these little rhyming ditties uh, that people used to help them remember their religious lessons. Okay. Rhyme was a demonic device, and this was used all the time. Uh, however, um, the, um, uh, the 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 sort of cutesy piousness of all this makes me kind of suspicious. Uh, and I, at any rate, um, uh, there's no other source uh, indicating that uh, Tetzel made this statement. Uh, this is all there is, but uh, you know, a lot of it has been, uh, it's, been it's made a lot of. And here's, the really, here's another really interesting part of the Tetzel story. Now Tetzel died uh, less than two years after the indulgence controversy began. He died in 1519. He spent most of the time uh, most of those last um, 18 months of his life in very poor health. So that was bad enough. But then, Karl von Miltitz, now Karl von Miltitz was a Catholic. He was not a Protestant, nor did he become a Protestant. Miltitz proceeded to savage Tetzel's character. Uh, he wrote and published pamphlets saying, what a rotten guy and a, you know, a, a criminal Tetzel was. And I think, I think Miltitz, wrote, uh, Miltitz was uh, just incensed that Tetzel had been at the heart of all this. On the other hand, Luther, who never met Tetzel firsthand, wrote him a letter. Yeah, he wrote him a letter while he was ailing and uh, in a sickbed. And, the letter, and Luther's letter said, I really feel sorry for you because you, you're really not responsible for all this. Luther didn't retract any of his teachings over it, but he felt sorry for Tetzel. He felt, he felt that, sorry that, 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 that Tetzel was feeling so badly. Um, at any rate, uh, this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, just awful biography of Tetzel by Paul. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm looking at the animal that Tetzel's riding. It's a donkey. Oh, okay. I just I look to me like a dog. I wonder no, no, it's a donkey. Some symbolism in that. No, no. yeah. No, it's 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 it's, a, it's an ass, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyhow, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, so so no, no that's right. Uh, Tetzel's, uh, sorry, uh, Miltitz's uh, uh, sort of uh, scathing account of Tetzel's, in fact, what passed into most of the literature of the period, uh, and until um, until the nineteenth uh, uh, century, uh, when there was a kind of retreat from all this. And uh, the retreat actually had to do with German nationalism. Uh, instead of thinking of themselves as Saxons and Thuringians and Prussians and Catholics and Lutherans, right, there was more of an emphasis among Germans on thinking of themselves as Germans. Okay, so Tetzel was a German. He was, you know, and um, uh, there was an Alsatian uh, priest, uh, Nicholas Paulus. He actually wrote a three-volume history of indulgences in the Middle Ages, uh, published back in the 20s. 
Um, and he also wrote a biography of Tetzel. And uh, uh, he examined this uh, text of Miltitz very, very carefully. <laughs> he said, none of this ever happened. Okay. Miltitz just sort of had it in for Tetzel because he was related with this indulgence controversy. So uh, um, as far as, again, the guest of honor is concerned, um, what, he, uh, you know, what he did in 1517 was unobjectionable in canon law and unobjectionable in theology. Unless, of course, you object to you know, Catholic teaching about justification. Okay? And uh, in that case, then Tetzel was pulling, you know, Tetzel was doing something wrong. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the issue wasn't about uh, abuse of indulgences. Luther would have had problems with indulgences even if there wasn't any hint of abuse anywhere. Okay? because they fit into a Christian anthropology that he had rejected. Okay? This also explains why that schism, that Contarini and Pole and Melanchthon and the Emperor Charles V himself tried to reconcile, well, it's, it's the reason why it lasts today. There's a fundamental disagreement about the human person and how the human person stands before God in the process of atonement. And I think I'll stop there and uh, then entertain questions. And Dr. Schaffern had agreed to entertain questions, and an intelligent audience like this should have learned. Can you just take a minute about the, the theology of indulgences? Did everyone hold this idea that the church held a treasury of merit that it could transfer, or were there other right theories? That was the main theory, uh, and it's a biblical theory. Um, uh, for one, right, St. Peter says that the blood of Christ is the price of your redemption. Paul uses that language. It's, it's used continuously in the New Testament. So uh, uh, that, that the, the, the mercantile and monetary metaphors, those were all just taken from, they were, you know, they were taken from scripture. Uh, the, the treasury of merit crystallized as a more or less formal doctrine in the writings of the scholastics, like Aquinas and Bonaventure, in, the, in their uh, commentaries on the sentences in the 1250s. Um, but there are hints of it in William of Auxerre and uh, William of um, Auvergne, who were writing in the 1230s. Okay? Don't forget, too, right? It's all about redemption, right? Well, redemption is a red emptio, a buying back. And it's the same, it's the same sort of uh, etymology in the European vernaculars as it is in Latin. Greek, too, I think, for that matter. What does necessarily mean this schism different from others? Because in the church's history, history, they often had controversy. Oh, you know, that's a good question. Um, what made this one different, what, what made it permanent, was something I mentioned during the talk, elites. Um, in those areas, well, let's put it this way. Uh, Protestantism became the majority religion where the rulers decided it was going to be the majority religion. Okay. Um, where it wasn't going to be the majority religion, Protestantism could make certain, like France is a good case, because although the French monarchy was committed to Catholicism, they're too busy fighting the Habsburgs to really worry about French Protestants. Okay? Um, so they had more freedom of movement there than they had in a lot of other places. 10% of the population, maybe maximum. Okay? Um, but in the Germanies, that was, that was all uh, princely uh, enterprise. Uh, in the imperial free cities, it was the municipal councils. In England, it was Henry VIII. Um, and Geneva, it was Calvin. Okay. Um, there were, of course, other places that had large Protestant, a large Protestant presence, like Austria and Poland. By 1560, there were a very large, maybe 40, maybe more percent of the population. But after, uh, in South Germany, after the Jesuits uh, began their mission, and in Poland, it actually was the Capuchins, uh, of, 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 uh, a subdivision of the Franciscans. Um, uh, after the, after the, the Jesuit missions in South Germany and the Franciscan missions in Poland, those countries were returned to you know, 80, 90 percent Catholic population. Ma'am? The meaning of pure 
It's, it's the Latin form of Pirno. What's that? It's the Latin form for Pirno, the city of Pirno. It's a place name. Yeah. Piernensis is Pirno in Latin. Okay? Yeah. Well, you, you, a couple, in a couple different ways, you express a, a confidence in the sophistication of the, the average Catholic, the medieval yep. villager. Yep. And I'm just wondering how you came to that. Uh, is it just, I don't know, what, what kind of evidence? The liturgy. That the liturgy. It's the liturgy. The liturgy is catechesis. Yeah. Um, uh, this has been most fully explored by Eamon Duffy in his book, The Stripping of the Altars. Um, uh, uh, in, in a lot of ways, liturgy was more complicated in those days, or more complex in those days than it is today. Uh, and uh, while we tend to think of the pre-Vatican II church as having no lay involvement, uh, it had plenty of lay involvement. It's just that the lay involvement normally manifested itself during the week and not on Sunday. Okay? So, uh, for instance, masses at side altars. Okay? Um, uh, whereas at Sunday, the priest is up there, and most of us are back here, during the week, we're right next to him at a side altar. And the, and the intention of the Mass, as often as today for dailies, right, uh, was, came from the laity. Okay. And uh, there were also, um, you know, uh, there are also uh, church councils prescribing that parents teach their children the prayers particularly, and not in the vernacular, teach them in their prayers in Latin. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, and, you know, they, they, this, the, uh, these uh, these ideas were acquired after years of after years of pr worship and prayer, basically, and that's what served as catechesis for the folks. It's, it's my recollection uh, that that uh, the astronomer Kepler was uh, a Lutheran. Yes, it was. Yeah, uh, he had an uncle who was a Jesuit. Mm -hmm. And apparently he was comfortable moving from one place to the next. I mean, he could, he could live in a Lutheran environment. He could live in a Catholic environment. Right. I almost have the idea that it was kind of easy to move back and forth between uh, religions. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, is, and that sounds consistent with what you said, that it was the, uh, the, the governor who determined what religion the region was going to be. This region would be, yeah. Yeah. Um, there, uh. Let's see. Um, there was a series of religious wars in Germany in the 1540s. They were called the Schmalkald Wars. Um, they ended in a draw. Uh, and there's uh, a number of recent studies have suggested that uh, you know, around the 1570s and 1580s, Germans had kind of accepted the idea that some of us were going to be Lutheran, some of us were going to be Catholic. And, um, you know, that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, they just wouldn't abide Calvinists, or Anabaptists for that matter. Um, so, uh, yeah, in, in a lot of respects, there was a kind of uh, a coexistence that had been worked out. Um, Kep I mean, you know, Kepler's a bit of an outlier because he was a celebrity and, you know, well-known intellectual and so on. Um, but I, but I think there's, you know, a lot of that for, uh, lesser known folks besides. What were the factors that uh, would have led some civil authorities to become Lutherans and others to say Catholic? Land. Uh, wherever the Reformation was implemented, the princes gained a lot of land out of it. And that happened, right? Henry VIII in England dissolved all the monasteries, took their lands. Um, what, in fact, when a, when a region went Protestant, one of the first things to go were the monasteries. Of course, Luther wrote a whole treatise against monasticism on the freedom of a Christian, where he took the monastic vow as a, as a violation of, uh, of the gospel precept. Okay. So um, uh, uh, it was a very violent age, and the costs of war were escalating all the time. Uh, that had actually been true since the late 11th century. Since the late 11th century, the cost of warfare had been growing and growing and growing. The early 16th century, particularly the first half of the 16th century, the great Habsburg Valois Wars were going on. So the German imperial family and the French royal family were at war for over 50 years. The theater of war was northern Italy. So 
these indiv- these rulers, uh, even at even at a high rank like an elector of the empire, which is right underneath you know the rank of emperor, uh, dukes and counts and what have you, they were continually strapped for money. The only source of wealth in that society was land. Okay? The question then was how to you know sort of how to uh, to get folks to go along with it. in Germany. I mean you know if you've ever been to a Lutheran communion service. It's hard to distinguish from a mass. And Luther himself was liturgically very conservative. Okay? Um, so, uh, and, and again, there, there were a number of princes who um, either from personal conviction or, uh, uh, or a desire for land or both, they still all in Germany, they all had to think about how are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna pull this off without causing widespread riots because at the same time, there's a great deal of peasant unrest in Germany. In 1525, the whole South erupted in a peasant rebellion, which was crushed with enormous brutality. Um, so it was, a, it was a kind of throw of the dice. Uh, and, and, and Henry VIII, for instance, um, there was a village named Clist St. Mary's uh, in the English Midlands. And the villagers of Clist St. Mary's refused to accept Henry's religious reforms. Clist St. Mary's is no longer there. The village was destroyed. Every single villager was killed. Okay. Now, you don't have to do that often before everybody else gets the message. Okay. And few of us are made of the stuff of martyrs. Why did it end up that the western and southern parts of Germany were predominantly Catholic? Well, because the southern part, the southern part was under the control of the German emperor who wanted to remain a Catholic. Uh, the Rhineland had a number of prince bishops. Germany's a little different because the, the church has a different constitutional role in Germany than it has anywhere else. Bishops have a lot more independence of the crown, uh, independence of other uh, rulers. Um, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're rulers in their own right. And so, for instance, Cologne stayed Catholic. Munster stayed Catholic uh, after an Anabaptist uprising. And between, uh, between the territory Cologne controlled and the territory Munster controlled, that was the balance of the Rhineland. So in that, those western areas, those remained Catholic. And Bavaria remained Catholic because the Duke wanted to stay Catholic. Austria stayed Catholic because the Habsburgs were turned to stay Catholic. How about the north and west? Most of the north went Protestant. The, the vast majority went Protestant. Did you have anything to do with it? Not really. Well, just that you were far away. You're not, you were far enough away from the emperor. In Scandinavia, the kings all made the commitment to do it. Uh, for instance, just like what happened in, in England. Uh, the only outli- the, the, the interesting outlier here is Scotland, uh, where, the, where the rulers made a conscious decision to go Calvinist. The only, place, the only other place that happened was in uh, Geneva. You highlighted uh, that the fundamental disagreement over indulgences has to do with Christian anthropology yeah. between Luther and uh, Catholic thinkers. Yeah. Luther and thinkers and Catholic thinkers. Yeah. Um, and you also mentioned the indulgences were not part of the work of East, obviously, as we're right. dealing with two separate near, you know, time periods or events here. Uh, but in your theological explanation of indulgences, you mentioned the scriptural roots. Yeah. So I'm wondering, did the East, at the contemporary East, especially like in the 16th century, have anything like this, or if not, then why was why not? If it well, was? okay. Uh, if, if, the short answer is that ultimately it all goes back to Augustine, okay, who has only a limited influence in the East, um, and the East has no crystallized doctrine of original sin. Okay. Um, you need, you, need, you need those sort of prerequisites for this to fit in. I've, I, I, uh, you know, in studying the East myself, I think, you know, I think there's a sort of implicit notion of original sin among some of the Eastern fathers, but it's not, it's just not, it's not worked out in the way it was in the West. Father Malloy, do you want to close us off or are you done? I, you know, I just, I'm just something, there's some kind of tidbit about the Jesuit presence and, you know, can you lampoon some theory there? Or that was really interesting that the 95 Thesis never got nailed to the door. I was interested in that. But the Jesuits being the counter-reformation. 
Well, it's like I said, though, that, I mean, you guys uh, reconquered the southern German lands for, for the Catholic Church. Canisius yeah, can, uh, among others, but uh, yeah. Uh, again, in Eastern Europe, Hungary had a large Protestant presence. Poland had a large Protestant presence. In Eastern Europe, it was mostly the Capuchins. Um, but, the, but the Jesuit fathers were mostly at work in uh, Germany and uh, Bavaria and Austria, basically. And, uh, um, uh, you know, for all the religious violence of the era, and one wouldn't want to discount that, there were bloodless victories, too. And uh, the South German lands and Hungary, Poland were the counter were the Counter Reformation's great bloodless victories. Well, thank you, and I hope this keeps us um, wanting more. The events that are being commemorated as 500 years ago, I think, can be understood as part of a process. And I think this illustrates very well. We're looking at the historical events and re-examining them can give us insights into our contemporary religious diversity and perhaps point us ways in which we can work towards reintegration again. So Dr. Schaffer, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. I hope I have occasion to see you again.